You are listening to Unscripted Moments, a podcast about propaganda. On this episode, the topic of conversation is, apparently I'm a PC fascist because I care about both human and non-human animals. Track one on 1996's Less Talk, More Rock. This song has a recent importance to me. I was completely delighted to see Propagandy play this one live during their May 2022 Ontario tour when they broke it out in Guelph, Ontario, completely unexpectedly near the end of a set. There were some listeners of the podcast in attendance at that show, too, and I remember all of us standing there gawking when Todd started in on that bass line, and it's one of my most vivid memories from that show in Guelph. And that three-show run I attended with my friend Jeff from North Star Tattoo in Buffalo, Bob Van Valen, who was our guest on the Tartuffe episode, Matt Milkowski was there, who wrote the lyrics and appeared as a guest on the Contest Song episode. Uh, My friend Brad Thompson was there. He's an attorney from Chicago who is slated to appear as a guest in the future. And also my concert-going pal Mandy Tucker from Ohio. They were all there at that special Guelph show, and all of us were pretty impressed with that particular show. It was an absolutely wonderful evening, and apparently I'm a PC fascist got played, so how can you go wrong, right? So, not only has the band played this tune again live recently, but this episode has some cool stuff, too. This is kind of a different one for us. This episode contains a cover and a conversation with our pal Adam, who performs by the solo project name Dead Museum. You might remember Adam's music from his grind-style cover of Leg Hold Trap on episode 53 with Conrad Sitchler. Oh, Conrad Sitchler was at the Guelph show, too. That was awesome. Um, But Adam also did a Doom-style cover of Hidden Curriculum on episode 68. So Adam has a cover of Homophobes Are Just Pissed Because They Can't Get Laid recorded as well, which will eventually appear in that episode. Uh, Keith and I have been talking about making that episode coming up pretty soon, too, so hopefully we can make that work for you. But Adam has made his four propaganda covers available as a free download EP at deadmuseum.bandcamp.com. It's a free download. You can just go over there and grab it and get it. It's really great. So if you like what Adam is making for the podcast, check out his other tunes and definitely download his propaganda covers EP. So we got that coming up for you in this episode. Another great treat on this episode is something we've never done. It's a guest interviewer. So our friend Matt Milkowski, who I just mentioned a moment ago because of the Guelph show, who also penned the lyrics to the finished cover that appeared in our contest song episode, conducts the second interview on this episode. So I am really pumped that Matt did a guest interview for the show. So Matt got together with Steve Choi, a musician and producer from RX Bandits, the Musicians Guild podcast, The Sound of Animals Fighting, and more to talk about propaganda. And apparently, I'm a PC fascist. So, Matt is a huge fan and has a ton of respect for Steve's work. So, I am beyond excited to have Matt fill in as a guest interviewer because it means that I get to sit back and learn and listen and enjoy uh, and hear what Matt has to say and have a great time with someone whose work he enjoys and respects with propaganda all as the focal point, of course. So first we'll hear Adam's cover and then we'll hear my half an hour chat with him about this song and the other covers he's made for the podcast over the past two years. And then after that, Matt Milkowski takes us over to bring us into an interview with Steve Choi from RX Bandits for our first ever guest interviewer. So this is going to be super fun. I really hope you all love it. So please enjoy the cover and then my interview with Adam and then Matt's interview with Steve Choi. Thanks for listening. And you can roll your- Adam Huff, welcome to Unscripted Moments, a podcast about propaganda. Thanks for having me, buddy. Adam, it is a delight to have you here. You have contributed 
to the podcast on multiple occasions at this point, but it's finally glad to have you here for a chat. So why don't you go ahead and just spend a moment and introduce yourself a little bit to the listeners and you can tell them whatever you feel like about yourself. All right. Sounds good. Uh, basically, I'm just a you know local musician from my DIY scene here in central Minnesota. Uh, I'm from St. Cloud. That's where I'm still still rocking these days. It's about an hour north of Minneapolis. Nice. So there's a little overlap between the scenes, but uh, not not as much as we'd want there to be sometimes, but that's yeah. how it goes. <laughs> um, yeah, I've been playing in bands here since I was about, uh, well, I guess I did my first open mic when I was 13. So that was 27 years ago. So, nice. Uh, yeah, just been doing, just been doing that, you know, doing the DIY scene here for, for a couple decades now. I love it. I'm trying to think if you're my, if you're the first guest I've ever had from Minnesota. Anyway, maybe, maybe you are. I can't really remember off the top of my head. Um, I don't recall any and we, we tend to notice, you know, yeah. we, we remember. <laughs> yeah. I love that. Um, so Adam, you like seeing as you're here on the propaganda podcast, like what is your history with, uh, with this band and, uh, anything like that about finding them or seeing them live or anything that jumps out to you about your own personal experience and memories, uh, regarding this band? Sure. Uh, definitely been, been with them for a long time. I'm, I'm one of those people who thinks less talk is their best album, except maybe victory lap. That's a close second these days. Nice. Never thought that would happen, but, uh, <laughs> I kind of tuned out during the beef years, to be honest with you, which I know is kind of blasphemous on, <laughs> on this podcast. But uh, yeah, I guess, you know, well, I'm I was 11 or 12 when Dookie came out. So that's nice. where a lot of people my age got into the whole uh, their toes dipped into the punk thing. So that led to, you know, going down the rabbit hole as much as we could pre Internet days or yeah, yeah. Not quite pre internet, but you know, primitive internet days. Um, so my parents owned a record store when I was a toddler. Um, Sweet. So my dad still has a bunch of those records. So from here in Green Day, you know, I'd see them wearing t shirts and shit like that. So I found like Dead Kennedys and Germs and uh, Crass. Didn't really get into Crass, but you know, just some of the records that were left over from my parents' old store. So that kind of helped me get into like the, the political side of punk, which, uh, I suppose was just kind of a natural progression into prep Gandhi when I found them. Uh, I think, I think probably how I found them was one of the first two fat comps. I'm not sure which one, but my friends, older brothers were into like no effects and all that skate stuff. So that's how I found fat records. And then yeah, good riddance and propaganda really stuck out a lot. Cause I liked the whole, the politics of it, you know, love so, it. Yeah. Have you ever gotten to see the band live before? Yeah. Uh, only twice. I don't, get to that many shows because you know i'm an hour away from minneapolis and sure I've never had a driver's license so oh nice <laughs> yeah um <laughs> not everyone says nice to that no um, that's one of the that's one of the punkest things you can do i think hey thanks a little validation from greg i appreciate yeah. that um <laughs> so the first time i saw him play was at first avenue uh that would have been probably 2000 2001 whenever they were touring for uh today's empires nice and then uh didn't see him again until this victory lap tour actually it was the first first show of the tour uh they kicked it off in minneapolis that was in 2017 i think nice uh, so you never you never saw beef live no never saw beef live interesting saw so you saw as... the trio and no b and sue lynn yep yep so never saw john but i did see todd that must have been his first tour i'd assume uh, I think he, he joined the band in 97. So it was probably, oh, oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Huh. So he, he was in there real quick after okay. less talk, after less talk came out. Yeah. Oh, no kidding. Um, okay. Well, Adam, uh, I'm, I'm delighted to feature you here on the, apparently I'm a PC fascist episode. And before we get into chatting about the song, uh, I want to play the cover that you made of this tune. Um, so do you want to spend a second and like introduce the creation of this cover um so that listeners can just kind of have a little preview of your thinking before we actually hear it okay all right um what was i thinking that's always that's always <laughs> a good question uh well i guess the first first two covers i submitted to you guys were kind of like thrashy hardcore covers so i want to do something a little different um i think i actually sent you the homophobes one before this one yep. if i'm not mistaken that'll, yeah that that'll, one's coming soon yeah sure um i think uh just like the natural swing feel to 
more mostly the bass but kind of the guitar i don't if you play pc fashion on an acoustic guitar it's like super like poppy like swingy back and forth you know kind of got that groove to it so i was yeah. just like oh why not do like a little jazzy like lounge act version of that so yeah me and uh me and the singer luke from my my main band these days left hand path um he did some of the vocals with me and then uh i think this is the only track i've sent you guys that has actual live drums on it nice just do midi programming for that stuff so uh yeah so my drummer luke well they're both named luke different people uh <laughs> but anyways yeah got some live drums on it just had some beers at band practice one night when a couple of the other guys didn't show up and busted out some some vocals, had some fun with it. And uh, you know, I think it turned out fun enough. All right, let's hear it. This is uh, your cover of Apparently I'm a PC Fascist. consuming animals. animals i just asked right? him the beer that i'm drinking <laughs> hey buddy i knew you were still punk awesome i love the smooth jazz like almost like vegas lounge feel to this cover i mean it's just it's got this pocket to it that you can just kind of sit back and relax on and i love that little swingy description you talked about before hearing the song about how if you play it on an acoustic guitar, it just kind of like has this little like swing rhythm to it. You can just like bob your head back and forth. It really, you really captured a different essence of this song that uh, people may not really latch on to right away until you kind of like really analyze how it makes you feel when you hear it performed in a different style. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I, I did try my best to not really change any of the vocal dynamics so i mean it i think it matches up pretty well with the original as far as the timing and like you know uh, there's not there's not a whole lot of harmony or melody in this song it's pretty it's pretty talky so that wasn't too hard but as far as timing wise i think it fits up pretty well with the original tempo was this a was this a hard cover to put together or what did it come together pretty well for y'all <laughs> i think it took me about uh 30 minutes to record this so <laughs> i love that like whenever i i like to go on instagram and like put a little message in the stories and say hey does anybody want to record a cover for so and so bust out your you know your iphone voice memos app and have a go and send it to me i love the ones that people uh send me that are like completely in the moment and they try it like they they practice it like three times and then they just record it and send me their first take that's 
That's like my favorite thing ever. I love it when that happens. Yeah, this one, um, well, the music took about a half hour, but then just because, you know, like I said, we were just having some beers and recording yeah. vocals. I had 23 vocal twit takes between the two of us. But nice. Just ended up, uh, and and apparently that was the best that existed out of all of that. So, you know, whatever. I love it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the first the first two covers, I sent you the Hidden Curriculum and uh, Leg Hold Trap. Those, those are the uh, one and only times I've ever seen either of those songs was recorded and put onto the track. So let's um, let's hear about the any. Do you have any thoughts on like the lyrics of PC Fascist or anything like that? Any like thoughts on this song in particular, either your version or the band's version or the lyrics in general that you you know were reflecting upon uh, in the lead up to our conversation today? For sure. Um, well, like I said, big less talk head. So yeah, that. This song is like my anti-manifesto, you know, like th I think this song just like kicks off the album so great. And, you know, excuse me. Um, yeah, I'm like I said, I'm in central Minnesota outside of Minneapolis. Uh, so it's, it's a little rural. So going vegan here in the mid 90s was a real uh, shit show, you know every everyone wanting to condescendingly ask you why you don't eat meat and right. all that with you know not actually giving a shit what your reasoning is but you know so i guess i think uh that the line you can roll your eyes and marginalize me is always just been like that's it that's it right there you know and play off my insecurities you know yeah just, what uh, was your you know i'm curious about that that mid 90s uh transition for you because going vegan in 2022 versus the mid 90s is it's a totally different world um, I'm wondering what some of your, your go-tos were back in the day to kind of get yourself through that transition before all these like new products existed that are meant to like, you know, ease meat eaters into a vegan lifestyle. I'm wondering like what, what some of your big memories were when you were giving this a go for the first time. Sure. Uh, well, I was 15. I'd be lying if I didn't say, you know, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches weren't a huge part of that still are, you know, they're yeah. great, but, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, just kind of trying to do my best with veggie stuff uh as as the years went on you know when I got to young adulthood I definitely started getting into the whole vegan from scratch thing making my own vegan cheese and sausages and all that stuff you know mm -hmm. which is still fun to do but it's like so inconvenient that it's sure it, it is nice to have. give me convenience or give me death right <laughs> Greg? um mm -hmm. <laughs> so so I, you know I I don't hate on uh the fast food restaurants and all this buying into the to the vegetarian items things it's like they they could be yeah. slightly less evil well you know existing so i know i mean i've i've eaten vegan at taco bell many times at this point oh, and yeah. uh it's you know the the pace of life is so overwhelming that sometimes you just got to do what you got to do to get some food in your belly <laughs> absolutely man <laughs> uh, but yeah as far as what else i was making back then um Tofurkey slices have been around for a really long time. Those were those were a savior. Um, and then I don't remember the name of it, but there was some like powdered box mix that you would mix with a brick of tofu and patty them up into burgers. And I haven't seen it for, you know, a couple decades, probably. But uh, those were so delicious. I, I should try to replicate that in my in my own kitchen sometime here now that we're talking about it. Haven't oh, thought I about it. those for a while. <laughs> I love it. I love it. What are um? Do you have any like food recommendations uh for like you know recipe sites or anything that you use that you wanted to recommend to people? Oh boy. Uh, I don't know about sites. I mean, I, cookbooks. You know, uh, Isha Chandra Moskowitz and uh, Terry Hope Romero, both of their collabs back in the day were amazing. Of course, Vegan Nomicon, but you know, Vegan Brunch was one of theirs that was also great. But yeah, I would say get their cookbooks. You know support nice publishers while we're at it um any other you know thoughts on like lines in the in the uh song that uh really resonate or even stories of like you know what you remember of particular times in your life where you felt that marginalization or anything that you felt like sharing should i just call out every guy i've ever been in a band with except for uh, benny <laughs> <laughs> nice uh yeah you know i mean nothing uh I mean, yeah, I mean, that, that's the biggest part. I mean, the whole song is pretty, it's pretty, it's a pretty straightforward song. Um, some of my otherwise brilliant and productive friends, you know, I got a bunch of lefty friends that, uh, you know, still 
eat meat with every meal and that's fine i don't i don't care you know yeah i i'm, I too, love I'm too old to preach to people about that i'll bitch it you know people on twitter because that's what my garbage twitter is for but yeah, you yeah. Know, in real life i try to be a little more chill <laughs> yeah i you know i i love thinking back on some of the stories that have come out on the podcast like i think about uh when Lindsay from frenzel ram was on to talk about um humane meat and he remembers like being at shows in the 90s and seeing people singing these songs and then he would see them in line at the at the mcdonald's down from the venue um like after leaving the show and it's it's just a really interesting sort of people watching experiment, you know, seeing the behaviors of people and like watching how people learn information, process it, and then how they behave in response to, the, to that information. It's just a really interesting way to go through your day, you know? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's uh, there used to be this all ages uh, indie venue in town here called Cheap Thrills. And it was like across the street and across the parking lot from a McDonald's. So like every weekend there would be all these punk kids filling up this McDonald's so that a couple of the Minneapolis bands called it the punk rock McDonald's. Which nice. Is funny. All these, cause you know, half the bands at this little punk venue are all vegans and all the kids are singing along and going to fill their bellies with McDonald's. Between reminds, sets. reminds me of that Wesley Willis song, rock and roll McDonald's. Rock and roll McDonald's yeah. He, he played in my, my little town here twice in the nineties. Awesome. He was still with us at the Java joint, which was like a legendary all ages venue in Minnesota for the eighties and nineties, which unfortunately is no longer with us, but yeah, uh, that's a, I guess let's, let's go on this tangent. That's definitely a huge part of how I got into the punk thing too, is just every weekend there were shows there, you know, national touring acts, like stuff that you wouldn't expect to be in a town of 50,000 people, you know, mm -hmm. well, like Wesley Willis, for example, but yeah, I mean, all kinds of old school well whatever whatever is it old school now the 90s stuff i don't remember yeah. Uber patrol and diesel boy came through on a tour together there that was that was the only fat band i recall seeing there but you know yeah nice Good stuff for a little punk kid you know um i recently went to those three three of the propaganda shows in southern ontario and at the guelph show the last show i got to hang out with conrad sichler uh singer of john k sampson's high school band toothpick hercules who wrote the song leg hold trap which you also did sort of a hardcore cover of uh for the podcast back on that episode um what do you remember about putting together that cover because uh it, it was it's a delightfully outside the box cover for how that song actually sounds and i love what you did with it uh tell me the story of doing leg hold trap that one was uh the only version i ever heard of that was on that uh double recess seven inch um there's a live version mm -hmm. and they're like this might be a butcher cover or whatever they're talking about i had no idea what the song was but uh so yeah that was just from mem from memory and then uh i think i found out from probably something like you posted or something but uh that it was on like a deluxe version of how to clean everything I yeah think, it is right yeah the, the 20th yeah. anniversary yeah so it's like oh there's a studio version of this song that's yep. cool it got cut so, from the final record okay so yeah so then i listened to that after i'd already recorded the music and i was like ah this is close enough i threw in that little uh i don't know what you'd call it the little halftime musical ending just because i was like I, I don't know how to end this so just yeah threw that on there for fun to add length to the song but uh yeah did, did conrad hear the cover Oh I yeah, for sure. Did he? Oh, nice. I, yeah. I did. I did listen to that whole uh, that whole interview with him. That was pretty interesting. Yeah, I tell you what, that's one of the gems of this show is that really long chat with him about the early days of how to clean everything. Because you know he's listed as the fourth band member on the liner notes for how to sure. clean everything. It, it says in there, not in the band, excess baggage, third wheel, or something like that. Yeah. But he's listed in the liner notes right underneath the band names. So I was like. Hey, you know, this is pretty cool and this is pretty obscure propaganda lore here. And uh, here he is with me on the podcast. 
And then I got to hang out with him and we had lunch together in Burlington, Ontario. And then we went to the show together in Guelph. So it was, it's a delight, like the little connections that have been established from doing this show, you know? Yeah, that was definitely that. Yeah. Like you said, the lore, just the propaganda lore in that episode. It's like, huh, these guys, these guys were just dumb kids being in a yeah. band. They were just were a lot smarter than all, all of us, you know? <laughs> let's, um, let's chat about your hidden curriculum. Uh, cover that you did real quick you did sort of uh i got a bunch of covers for that episode i can't remember how many there were i think there might have been like three or four that got submitted and you did something that was like almost like doom metal uh if i if i remember correctly now it's been a couple months since i've heard it but it was as far as i remember a doom cover tell me a little bit about making that cover i think the i think another guy had the really doomy like eight minute long one um but yeah i mine started out with like the like uh what would you call it atmospheric or whatever type synth synthy stuff and then uh yeah got real thrashy um yeah i was trying to do black metal but i don't really know much about metals yeah <laughs> so i was like i think it's just a bunch of tremolo picking right um and so yeah i just like i spent like five bucks on some some uh midi pack some midi drum pack that was like black metal drums yeah there's a bunch of blast beats in here this will be fun to play with i'll you know i'll give them five bucks um uh yeah oh there's actually no guitar on that song it's just bass those are all those are just like three or four different bass parts with distortion because i i tried throwing some guitar tracks over the top of it but i don't know the tremolo picking just seemed like too muddied on guitar because that's not what i that's not my normal wheelhouse i'm sure there's a way to make it sound good but uh, it was a lot easier for me to get that clarity on bass. So I just uh, overdubbed a bunch of bass tracks on that. I I love it. Um, so you did another one. Uh, homophobes are just pissed because they can't get laid, which we haven't released yet. But for the um, just for the fun of it, uh, here is what it sounds like performed by Adam. Homophobes are just pissed because they can't get laid. Okay, so I was really stoked about this one because people may not know this about me, but I have an affinity for 80s like synth music and like uh, synth wave, like modern synth wave bands, like, you know, the Midnight and Gunship and stuff like that. Um, so this one was just a, a total delight for me. Uh, tell me a little bit about putting together your cover of Homophobes Are Just Pissed. Sure. Well, I I don't know those two bands you just said, but I'm gonna have to look into them. I don't They're really great. know any new stuff, but yeah, I'm a huge. Uh, I mean, I you know, grew up on Duran Duran and you know, In Excess. I love Pet Shop Boys, all that stuff. So, yeah, I just thought, like, I like the uh, the juxtaposition of like the like blasty punk beat original and you know singing about like fuck this macho tough guy shit, you know, kind of like the beginning of Less Talk, but. Uh, so I was like, yeah, that's great. I was like, I don't really want to just straight up cover this because, well, frankly, it'd be kind of boring, to be honest mm -hmm. with you. But I was like, well, let's just let's go the opposite way. Let's go like something like super like anti, you know, uh, traditionally masculine, even though in the 80s, Duran Duran was like, you know, gods amongst men. But that's lost its, uh, I don't know, machismo or whatever, something yeah. now. Anyway, whatever. Uh, yeah, so I was like, well, let's just do like a fun little, you know, synthy dance song version of it. And uh, 
that <laughs> that song is probably the only time you'll hear my buddy Ivan, who plays guitar in Left Hand Path, sing ever. So <laughs> he's the one who's just kind of like doing the talking monotone thing at the nice. beginning. So <laughs> but uh it's very funny. And uh yeah, man, we had a absolute blast recording to the vocals for that. Just you know, each trying to do like, oh, I'm gonna try to sound like Simon LeBon. I'm gonna try and sound like whoever, you know, and pretty much failing over and over. But you know, we we got enough good takes out of there to to slap something together. Um yeah, and I got to do a fake British? Is that what accent I'm trying to do there? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's something. It's something vaguely Western European. But uh, yeah, so that pretty much, uh, yeah, I just kind of arranged it in my head. And then it's like, okay, well, I, I can put these on synth easily after I figure out what the heck's going on in my brain. That's the easiest way to write for me usually. How does your band feel about you consistently bringing these um th these projects in is this something like the culture of the band is like you all bring in these like odd little projects and kind of just go with it uh, no i'm i'm the guy with too much free time in the band so <laughs> <laughs> that's that's pretty much just me bringing this this uh silliness in but i mean that that's kind of the dynamic of the band anyways i i just i bring the songs to the table and everyone learns them and they they write their little embellishments and whatever but as far as like song structure and all that's concerned uh it's they they let me have my little dictatorship and and it works out for everyone everyone's happy awesome well yeah. adam i am super stoked on your pc fascist leg hole trap hidden curriculum and homophobes are just piss covers like it's really cool that the, the variety of sounds that you and the, the members of your band have managed to put together for these four covers, you know, over the course of the last couple of years for the show is, is just really cool. And, you know, to have this variety uh, come from one person is just an absolute thrill. Um, you kind of have put together like a little EP worth of covers uh, at this point and, would you ever like, you know, put these as like a free download available anywhere? Yeah, I have um, the two that have aired so far. They're on my band camp for it's just dead museum dot band camp or whatever. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll put this one up on there, too. Um, and of course, it's all free. It's not even my music. Yeah. But yeah. Um, or I guess if people want to just go if they want to find dead museum band on on Twitter then uh, I could probably just post links there because there's love some it. other there's some other like good benefit comps that uh, I would love to plug, but I'm not going to sit here and list a bunch of uh, band camp URLs for that. But, you know, yeah, we we do a lot of we do a lot of benefit stuff as a band. Actually, our last show before COVID was a uh, Planned Parenthood benefit uh, in town here in St. Cloud, which we got like we raised like 800 bucks. for. Nice. What does um... Parenthood? But yeah, I mean, that's to, to donate out of pocket. So nice. What does, um, what does propaganda mean to you as a musician, fan of music and person who cares about the world? Uh, well, of course, Chris is a guitar God, so that's always been fun and it's been fun to watch him develop over the years. You know, I was a, I was probably like 14 when I first heard propaganda and it's like, whoa, this guy's this guy can play so fast, you know, and then like over the years, as I've grown as a musician, he has grown exponentially as a musician. And it's, uh, yeah, it's just been fun to watch that. And the addition of Todd, when Todd joined the band, I was just like, it blew my fucking mind, man. Like mm -hmm. I, I was like, how is this propaganda? I, I still love today's empire. It's like, that's probably third favorite album now that victory lap exists. So, uh, so yeah, Todd, Todd was a huge part of that. And I kind of got more into like the hardcore stuff as I was right around the time that that album came out. So that timed up perfectly for me. Um, and as people, it's just like that. They're just the band that every artist or musician or whatever should should strive to be as people. I mean, they're none of them are scumbags you're never worried about hearing about s someone from propaganda doing some horrible thing that i'm not even gonna you know give examples of <laughs> you know it's just like 
and they're uh yeah just i don't know they've they've shown me they've introduced me to so many topics throughout the years like with the the essays and less talk when i was a you know young teen it's like oh i never even thought of these concepts like there's the one dollar one vote thing or there's the there's the uh we support our troops ribbon that says well fuck you then or whatever at the bottom <laughs> yeah this is like oh these concepts had never occurred to me i'm like definitely totally middle america you know grew up in the height of the satanic panic you know in, in not quite rural minnesota you know like we have a target and all that i mean we have more than that now but when i'm talking i'm talking about when we were when i was growing up but um yeah lots of lots of weird stuff that was kind of shattered by propaganda and and good riddance and dead kennedys and stuff and i went to catholic school until eighth grade also so you know Oh, breeds an atheist like that i tell you what i i uh you know i went to those monday night um religion classes and stuff every oh, C- every week cd yeah oh yeah, yeah. I, you, you were the kids that would mess up our desks on monday nights yeah that was us <laughs> yeah it was every single week all the way through catholic confirmation when yeah. i was like 13 or whatever or 12 oh, wow. or something um but yeah i mean it's the, the amount of ideas you mentioned the variety of topics I'm still like having my mind blown on the variety of topics that get discussed just in seven albums worth of songs. You know, it is the last couple of years have just been rabbit hole after rabbit hole for me, uh, for doing this show. And it is about so much more than just music. It's about, you know, humanity itself. Um, that's kind of what I've realized about, you know, doing this show is it's not just talking about music in songs. It's talking about civilization and how I process and understand this society that we've all, that we are all a part of and are born into. Um, I was never asked to be born, you know? And so I'm trying to figure it out and all of my confusion. So that's what this does for me. And I'm glad that you're a part of our journey here and I'm glad that you've submitted so many awesome covers and stuff to the, to the show. And it's uh, wonderful to have your, your comments and everything now for the show itself. Well, thanks, man. It's, it's, it's awesome to be a part of this, uh, this living history project that you guys are doing because it, it is finite in what you can cover. So, you know, like, perish the thought but uh, there, there's an end to this at some point this will be a complete tome at some point and i'm it's hoping just, it's it's cool it's cool that just to have a, a little little fingerprint on this you know i love and, it uh, you got tons of songs left so I, I can't imagine i won't shoot another cover your way sometime here yes well, are you Adam... are you guys doing die for the flag oh yeah we're hoping to do every song it's okay. just that uh you know the pace of the show waxes and wanes and uh yeah. episodes have begun to the format has begun to shift a little bit we kind of peaked with the potemkin city limits five hour episode um and we we kind of like have have rethought the format and structure of it ever since then but uh we you know, are on this like weird little journey at the moment where some episodes are looking a little different these days than they were earlier on. But that's because the world looks a little different than, you know, mid 2020 when we started the show. It's yeah, it um, looks terrible, actually. It's 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 yeah, it's wild how how different everything is since we started, because when we started, the world was closed. Yeah. Nothing was happening. The worst thing we had then was a global pandemic. I know Keith and I had nothing to do but sit in our apartments and houses and, you know, do our jobs online and then make the show. And now there's just so much more going on than just that, that uh, the show looks a little different, but we're still loving it and having a great time. And now you get to be on it. Hell yeah, man. Well, I'm going to, since I already brought up Die for the Flag, I'm just going to like put some external pressure on me and uh let you know i was thinking about doing like a like a toby keith style cover of die for the flag please I think that would be perfect what do you please think? do right. it and you can come back and you can talk to me about it <laughs> hell yeah hell so, yeah brother <laughs> so that's a, so midwestern i love it um so adam until next time thank you so much for coming on unscripted moments a podcast about propaganda and chatting about your covers it's been a pleasure man hey man pleasure's all mine buddy until next time. We search as your commodity through institutionalized violence and oppression of workers, women raped by sexism. And do you still exist? Unfading indignant to reason, collective self interest. I'll call you on your shit. Please call me on mine. 
Welcome, y'all. I'm Matt Molkowski, the guest interviewer and self-appointed Chicago ambassador to Unscripted Moments, a podcast about propaganda. Uh, so first off, big thanks to Greg and Keith for creating this little microcosmic propaganda community that we've got going on here. Um, and through them, we were able to connect with our very special guest for today's episode, Steve Choi. Uh, for those that aren't familiar, Steve is a multi-instrumentalist and all-out creative force. He's played guitar, uh, keys, and many other instruments for bands like RX Bandits, one of my favorite bands of all time, uh, The Sound of Animals Fighting, Pieced Out, Chinkies, and quite a few more. Uh, he also co-wrote on singles for the late rapper Lil Peep. He's done a lot of uh, engineering and production work on uh, records and projects ranging from hip-hop to hardcore solo projects. And um, for the last couple of years, he's been the host of the Musicians Guild podcast. Uh, well, last couple of years, last single year, something like that. Um, the podcast is great. If you haven't heard it, it sort of combines these uh, calming personal reflections on music and life and then has some really beautifully recorded interviews with music professionals from bands like Thrice, Joyce Manor, Taking Back Sunday, and many more. So, you know, I'd also like to add that just as a fan of Steve's uh, work for 20 plus years, I can say that uh, everything he works on turns to gold. And it seems like this stems from a really deep and sincere appreciation for the tangible power of music. And I know that's something that um, all the listeners of this podcast can really relate to on a deep level. You know, I think his projects exemplify what it means to be a caring artist and a caring human. And what I see in Steve, and granted, we've never met until today, so we'll see if that's the same. Uh, but honestly, everything that I try to develop in my students is what I see in him, which is to try and become a lifelong learner, an authentic collaborator, and someone who just understands the importance of nuance and balance in life. So for all those reasons and more, I am just so excited to spend some time uh, chatting and learning tonight. So with that said, Steve Choi, welcome to the podcast. Damn. <laughs> Thanks for having me, man. Did I, did I really I miss, appreciate it. Did I miss some stuff? No. I... <laughs> That <laughs> um, I just need to take a moment because that was so sweet and uh, mind fuckingly flattering that I need to take a moment to be present. <laughs> but I really appreciate that. So thank I hear you, you for man. That really nice intro. And it's um, it's it's from the heart. It's from the heart. It's great to be here with you. I think that's why it impacted me because I felt the sincerity in in the eloquence. But thank you. Uh, it's cool to be here. And thanks for having me. For sure. Uh, so we are here primarily to talk about propaganda and uh, a song in particular. But I figure we'll start off just kind of, you know, going back in time a little bit. Can you let us know how you got introduced to propaganda? Uh, maybe if you remember the first time you heard them. I heard them in the spring of 1995, about three weeks after Less Talk More Rock came out, I believe. Um, maybe I have my times mixed up by some months. I believe that record came out in 95, in spring of 95. But anyway, um, I heard them at my local record store. Uh, which was called The Last Record Store in downtown Santa Rosa, which is uh, my hometown in Northern California. It's about 55 miles north of San Francisco. And yeah, obviously the song we're talking about is apparently I'm a PC fascist. Um, and that was the first song I heard. And it, it punched me in the mind and the gut <laughs> at the same time. Awesome. Well, well, we'll get into that shortly. I'm curious if you still get punched um, anywhere when you listen to it today. Um, but, you know, thinking more big picture about the band first, you know, one of the reasons why I actually like I kind of reached out to you was at least from a fan's perspective, like to me, RX Bandits and Propagandi share a lot of similarities in your trajectory. I mean, there's 
California and the origin stories, you know, even though they're, they're Canadian, like that's kind of where they, you know, really blew up. You all obviously, and this may be before you got involved, but like started off with maybe a, a slightly more uh, clearly defined genre, whether it was ska punk for RX or like kind of skate punk for propaganda. But mm-hmm. immediately it was like clear that both of you all had something special, something different. And then very quickly, you all just kind of went like the, tr- the tree just branched out in all directions. And, you know, both bands completely defy genres on, you know, in a way that's extremely rare and heavy music. You know, I also, you know, from what I understand, like you all in RX have a very um, live and jam based approach to writing music, which I know Propagandi does, too, which I feel like is also unique sometimes for heavy music. So um, to me, there's just all these threads and connections. And I'm just sort of curious if you resonate with any of those or, you know, if you felt any kind of kinship with them for that reason. I absolutely do. Um, They were kind of huge musically at the time because uh, sonically and just by proxy being a Fat Records release, um, it it was striking to hear a band with so much technical ability, basically playing this genre with this production style, um, with just this high level of virtuosity, basically. And so you're used to hearing, you know, obviously when I think of this genre at the time, which now in retrospect, I clearly see that it has very little to do with the lag wagons and the no uses for a name and the no effects at the time, although they were associated, like I said, by, by proxy. But um, it w- for me as a kid, I didn't know that at 15. So, okay, Propagani, this is a cool name. Let's check this out. <laughs> and, then, and then I hear Let's Talk More Rock. And then I go backwards and listen to How to Clean Everything. And even then, it's just like I hear the shredding. I'm like, these riffs are amazing, you know? Um, these tones are sort of the production style of the time, that Ryan Green, really slappy, clicky, uh, you know, but... That said, when you listen to those records now, the recordings, they totally hold up. It's a very high recording quality, whatever you feel about the the production style of that, right? So um, that said, yeah, it really influenced me because I was like, okay, here's heavy music that is shreddy in a way that I can feel that this guitarist um, has really studied a lot of guitar players, you know, like has this r- really strong mastery of the guitar. And uh, yeah, it was huge for me to like get into punk like that because at the time they were probably one of the most technically sound punk bands I listened to um, because even at that time, Fugazi hadn't really reached the pinnacle of their technical refinement either as a band, even though I love those records. And that was the one other band that I really, really, really loved that I influenced me. So uh, yeah, that's how Propagani was so powerful and influenced my concept of punk music moving forward. You, you mentioned um, like the, that early production quality. And I know, you know, later down the road, they, I think a big part of the second half of their career was they got involved with, um, Jason Liver, uh, Livermore and, uh, Bill Stevenson at the blasting room. I was yeah. curious, like, have you ever crossed paths with them or that studio space, um, either as a musician or as an engineer before? You know, I've always wanted to, um, I've watched so many bands do so many things there, you know, so so far back to when I was just a kid when I first met Mike Park and, you know, seeing like old footage of this Japanese ska punk band called Kamuri that he signed at the time oh, like yeah. doing stuff there and me already being a huge Descendants fan. And, and at the time, like Bill Stevenson was one of the first people that I had heard of that was like an active musician in a band that was also running a successful studio and engineering and producing records. So as a kid to me, I was always, I was like instantly, wow, that's amazing, you know? So um, I haven't, I've never gotten to go there. RX was definitely considering it like two records ago, I think, but um, it never happened and I would love to. Sure. 
you you mentioned when you were a kid like uh d- didn't did you tour with Kemurai when like through Bruce Lee band or I mean you were pretty young when you first met Mike Park right yeah that stuff was like a year or two before I came onto the scene for Mike okay. um, because I was I those years I was still like a, a junior in high school <laughs> right. when he was doing like the first ska against racism tours okay. and stuff so he got me right um, at the end of me being 18, right before I turned 19, is when um, I met him at a venue in Petaluma, California, because my band was starting to gain notoriety locally, my high school band at the time, and we played a show with Link 80. Uh, right. So, right. Yeah. That's awesome. All right. Well, let's switch back to uh, Chris Hanna as a guitarist. So I know you mentioned like that crazy technical ability in those riffs. Um, I guess I'm curious, like, I know you're classically trained, you play a ton of instruments, you grew up playing, like, in orchestra settings, and you play guitar and drums and all that stuff. Um, so I was just sort of curious, like, Chris Hanna's always kind of talking about how he's he's not classically trained, like, he can't really read music, and he's like, I don't know what I'm doing, like, I don't know scales, I just, like, like you said earlier, like, I just, like, he loves guitarists, and at least, you know, that's what he says. It seems like hard for me to believe that completely. But I'm sort of curious, like in any of his um, performances or his songwriting, do you hear that side, that like untrained kind of outsider vibe or would that like, you know, is that surprising to you? No, I feel that for the most part, especially early on, that makes sense. He has this hybrid style of picking, um, you know, even even in like uh what's the first song on how to clean everything is it called anti manifesto is that what it is yeah um even then he's doing like it's funny because that record has a song called ska sucks but even in that song he's doing this like hybrid ska picking you know but it's this syncopated rhythm over this beat and them doing like this essentially what is like a reggae pattern in these uh major arpeggio and it's like It doesn't sound corny and it's like so innovative, you know, at the time. Uh, And then when you listen to songs like, and we thought nation states were a bad idea, like that riff, I was obsessed with that riff for like years in high school. Like I would play it constantly. It it took me a really long time to learn and perfect and get the details of it because I was obsessive like that. I would watch live videos of people playing the songs. I can make sure I was playing in the right position and all that. So, um, to go back to what you were asking, yeah, I, I really do feel like that makes sense because otherwise, you know, I guess there's a chance that he's like this creatively algorithmic genius that like <laughs> actually technically breaks down and studies these things and then goes, I'm going to make this awesome punk hybrid style of guitar playing. It'll be fused with metal and country rock. And you know what I mean? Like all these things. But I feel like it feels more likely that he just does it like naturally right and you know i can i can relate that that opening riff from nation states like so that was that was my introduction to the band on on a tape that my like punk mentor friend made for me you know and nice to this day i can't really pull it off but like i also that just like opened up so many doors and windows in my life you know hearing that that the first 20 seconds of that song so i hear you on that yeah you know, I wonder if this is going to be your answer, but I was actually talking to um, a couple of my buddies, my buddy Diego and Castro, who are also fans of RX. And one of them suggested I asked uh, if if you could cover a propaganda song, you feel like you, you'd give it a shot, either you alone or with RX. Like, is that something you consider doing ever? And if so, like, w- would that be the one since you've been practicing it? Or w- what do you think about that? There's a few that I would have a hard time choosing. Um <laughs> I wish we could, but I know the other guys aren't very big propaganda fans like like me. Like for me, um, and I'm I really appreciate how how much they've like kept the music quality as a band. It's it's really awesome. So I'm not one of those like only the old stuff people. But right. uh I, I would I have to be honest and say that their most important time of propaganda in my life though was <clears throat> in that era of less talk more rock so it would most likely be one of those songs just because i i love chasing that feeling like a lot of us sentimental bastards and artists like to do um so probably nation states or 
preteen McCarthyist. Nice. Or oh man, it's, it's tough. There's just there's so many. So <laughs> I, I I I don't think I can actually answer that question definitively. Sure. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm putting you on the spot with that one, too. But something, you know, I'm really just, this is just, you know, smoke and mirrors. I'm just planting the seeds so this will happen in, like, nine years from now. You'll forget about <laughs> this interview, legit. and you'll be like, wait, why am I, why do I want to cover this song? <laughs> That's my goal. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's there now. The seed is planted, for certain. Awesome. So, have you ever interacted with the band? Like, have you, do you have any special memories? Have you seen them perform live or like bumped into them? You know, I know they don't, they don't play a ton um, in the States over the years, but yeah, have you ever crossed paths or, or like, you know, heard things about them from your colleagues in the industry? Oddly, no. Um, I believe when Chris ran the band's Twitter, we interacted a couple times online. I believe, I believe it might have been Chris. Um, other than that, <laughs> I have a cassette tape of Propagandi live at Gilman in nice. 90, I want to say 93. I could be wrong about the year, but I believe the year is 93. And it's more heckling and banter between <laughs> the audience and band than there is playing. And there's just like minutes of people talking shit to them on stage and him being like, yeah, oh yeah, fuck you. Uh, yeah. Right on, Jord, right on. Yeah, Jord. Okay, uh, we're here tonight to play a bunch of new songs that you will neither like nor recognize. Uh, this first song is about... Uh, the relation between how we treat each other and how we treat animals. It seems to me if you treat animals like shit, it's just a matter of time you'll treat people like shit. And if you wonder why our society treats women like biological machines just built to serve the sexual impulses of men, or why workers are treated like biological machines to serve the fucking financial interests of the rich, just look at the fucking meat industry or the dairy industry and you'll see a fucking direct connection. <laughs> And how many of you people cheering are wearing leather products? Leather, the euphemism for fucking animal flesh. So it's basically either, either you don't know or you don't care. If you don't know, then go find out. There's plenty of places here in this city to find out about animal rights. And if you don't care, then you can just go to fucking hell and lick my left nut. Oh, fucking shut the fuck up. You room full of asses. Ready, shithead. You know, like all the in the back and like, I remember listening, I used to listen to that all the time for some reason when I was a kid. I just, that was like a thing back then where people would make uh, cassettes of live shows. They would just take really rudimentary recordings or if they could just get like a stereo recording off the crappy board. You know, there was lots of like live at Gilman tapes, just straight bootleg, like people just doing it. Z go to Kinko's, you make the cover, you release it, you sell it for five bucks, you know, try and for get sure. some beer or food, right? Like, um, <clears throat> so that's about as close as I came. And I have never gotten to see the band live either. So I bring that tape up because I actually felt like I was close to them in a certain way after listening to that, like assuming that they were being sincere on stage, which at the time sound, it sounded like to me, you know? Right. You know, you mentioned Twitter interactions. Like I, I think so. Chris Hanna, yeah, that is, that's his, that was his account. He, he kind of like at some point a couple of years ago, sort of stopped being active on Twitter, except for like here and there. But if I'm not mistaken, like I think a question that you posed may have led to him removing like the longtime title of the North Korea of punk. Does that ring a bell with you? Oh, yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, you're right. I only remember that because it was like kind of worlds colliding. Um, but it was just, you know, he's had like yeah, some, right. some strange taglines. And that one was up there for quite a while, I feel like. And then I was like, oh, yeah. like you just kind of posed a question. And I forgot exactly how it went down. 
But um, I think he was just he had mixed feelings and then like changed it to something else after that. No, you're totally right. And I forgot about that until now. I think I was just curious because I also know that citing North Korea is kind of like a solid, I don't know what, what one would call it, but a, a totem of sorts for making a, a point about, you know, extreme political circumstances and stuff. So um, I don't remember exactly what I said, but I remember the emotion and I, I wasn't like pissed or anything like that. I think I was just curious because I was like, whoa, like, I really like this band. They're like, was it like an image of a North Korean flag or something? There, or something there might, like there, there might have been. Um, I don't remember exactly. I, I definitely remember a very polite exchange and in like Chris Hanna fashion. I think he was just kind of like put the lens on himself. I think he's, I remember exactly what he said, but I think he was sort of like, oh. I hadn't thought about this or that and, and then eventually changed it too. So, Oh yeah. I remember him being very nice and polite too. So. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, now he's active on his uh, Patreon, but not so much on Twitter. But I mean, you know, cool. More power to anyone who needs a break from Twitter. So yeah, I, I was just happy to interact with somebody who was so instrumental in, in introducing me to so many important ideas. Like, um, through propaganda is when I ingested a lot of materials from AK Press. You know, I, mm -hmm. as a 16, 17 year old, I was starting to read Noam Chomsky and understanding these, like, at the in context extreme ideas, but in context of like the universe, actually not very extreme at all. But, anyways, so it was cool to, you know, interact with that to it or to any extent because. Kind of, it was like he's like legit, like a a a teenage like hero for me. It was just like, boom! Here's somebody with the power of music, which is already so powerful, is gonna teach you more than you could learn in a year of a political science class. You know what I mean? And like, that was really, really powerful for me. Yeah, I mean. After that first record, you know, I know with less talk, like that was part of their goal was to separate the like, you know, the frat punk dude bros fans from, yeah. from those who would like, you know, eat up that knowledge. And I think, you know, they're, they're definitely that changes tra trajectory and like whoever was along for the ride, you know, benefit in the long run. So, yeah. And but it was done with such surgical precision on every level, in my opinion particularly lyrically the no fat it's like <laughs> every point made every point witty every base covered like yeah it was huge for me absolutely do you um do you have any like particular reaction to anyone else in the band like just the drums the, the bass um i mean either from the john k samson era that we're talking about or like later when you know, Todd Kowalski joined, um, or has it always been kind of Chris Hanna has been the focus of your attention? No, I mean, that was obviously something that we didn't get into yet, but that was also really striking to me. You know, um, I think punk and indie bands that had singers kind of switch off was, was already a thing, right? Especially in the nineties, a lot of us were familiar, we're comfortable with it, but the polarity of those and between, you know, first time I'm hearing Anchorless or, you know, any of, it's John, right? That's his Yeah, name? yeah, yeah, John. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So the, I think John has one other song on Let's Talk More Rock. Uh, um, there's a couple, like you said, there's, there's some back and forth and there's a couple ones. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was like, wow, it was so striking because, you know, obviously everybody knows how different these voices are not just in the voice themselves, but in the delivery, the emotion behind the voice, the things that are being sung about, you know, it's like, but I always love that in bands when you feel the dichotomy, when you feel the dance between when it's pulling apart or when it's cooperating, you know, um, these kind of bands are awesome. That's when the story gets so rich and deep and you, you appreciate this, you know what I mean? Uh, so 
yeah, I mean, it was, it was cool to see then so early, uh, the bud of the weaker thens, you know, because those, those songs, obviously it's such a smooth, (laughs) smooth transition, you know? And, uh, I never really vibed out with the weaker thens. There was definitely a lot of songs I liked, but I had so many friends that were very, very huge fans, you know, but still for me, you know, being the kind of music nerd I am, I still appreciate that story and, you know, that whole thing, the diaspora from just their particular story, you know, it's cool. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, since we're in that era, let's, let's move on to the song itself. Um, so we're, we're talking about apparently I'm a PC fascist. You know, quite quite the title for the first song on the album there. Um, so, you know, I know you've touched on this maybe more generally, but is there anything about the song in particular that that grabs you musically? Um, a, yeah. A tone, a part, just like the way it feels, anything that grabs you musically from this song in particular? Yeah, so from which perspective, now or then? Uh, let's Let's start with then. Let's take it back. <laughs> So then it was, wow, this sounds like technical, like more complicated and shreddy Green Day because um, it was in that mid-tempo range. And that particular chord progression of going like one, seven, four, one, like that, it was like a very kind of East Bay punk Green day type tonality, which I hadn't heard a lot of like skate punk or Canadian in particular Canadian punk bands like do. So then I was like in instantly, you know, there was cool drum fills and, um, at the time it sounded so bright and fat, you know? Uh, so those are the things that struck me then in particular about the song. Gotcha. Um, what about now? I'm really curious how you feel about that, that bass tone that, that starts the album. Okay. So <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. Cause that would have been my first, that would have been the first observation now, okay. which is the, the really, shall we say, uh, extreme bass tone. Yes, the extreme bass tone. It sounds okay. like s- six sans amps stacked on top of each other, like going direct. <laughs> yeah. Like, um, what, go ahead. I was going to say, it's just now I think that if you took Fieldy, the bass player of Korn's bass, and you just played the high notes and you played that song with it, you would get the ba- same bass tone. It's like that slinky and that that much attack, which comes from a lot of it comes from uh, the string itself rattling on the fret. So they've they've remastered a couple of their albums, um, you know, some some just to remaster some like actually, you know, digging into tracks and tinkering with them at that level. So thinking about that, that bass tone or just the sound of that album in general, like, w- would you be excited to uh, like if that project were put in your lap and someone's like, give this a shot to totally remaster it. Is that something that sounds exciting to you or do you feel like there's the nostalgia like that's the tone, that's the feel that belongs for that era? Yeah, I'm very much the latter with recordings. I think like if people want to do it fine, if people want to listen to it, I'm I'm cool, but if you asked my opinion, I I don't really think it ever needs to be done. Um unless we're talking about bringing old recordings into an era where they're actually audible, like those kind of remasterings. For sure. Especially yeah. with bands like that, with albums like that. It's like would I choose those tones now? No, but it still sounds great for the, the recording is clean, you know, nothing, no compression is weird. It's not overly anything. The recording itself is still really clean. It's just that the tones are extreme, you know? Um, so that said, I think it's perfect for what it is. I think most recordings, um, a lot of them end up being like these Lego statues that are like, you know, just formed and, refine and reposition but i always like the quick sketch photograph approach where you're just capturing what it is at that time even if you multi-track and build it up you can still have the overarching pretense of 
we're building this, but we need to build it within a time frame that retains the priority around let's capture the vibe of this moment. And that's always been my approach in my own music with RX and, and a lot of things, uh, not everything, not things, pop things I work on, but, um, everything else. So, uh, yeah, I really feel like it, it doesn't need to be remixed or remastered personally, my, my personal opinion. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, and, and not that I've heard any, any plans for that, but it's just curious. <laughs> um, yeah. So let's, let's switch over to, uh, like the lyrics, the theme of this song. Um, I mean, these songs are quick, right? Where they're like one and a half, two minutes, but, um, you know, Chris is always great at packing so much content into a, a small package. Um, are there, are there any either particular lines or just themes from this song that stand out to you? The, the main thing that really ties the whole thing together immediately is I'll call you on your shit. You call me on mine. There it is. Like even as a teenager, I understood that. I understood how, what a caveat that was actually to the whole thing, which is instantly deflating the position of somebody else being like, you're a self-righteous uh, soapboxing moron, you know? Right. It, it, it recontextualizes it all into these are my claims, but I'm willing to engage in a dialogue and the interplay of uh, you know, basically propagating these ideas. I'll call you on your shit. Please call me on mine. You know? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm curious, like I know personally the last few years, you know, it's like one headspace to when you're at odds with like major opposing forces that are to some extent out of your control. But you know, a song like this where, you know, maybe Chris is talking about this tension with people that, are supposedly kind of on the same page as him, you know, maybe like your friends or yeah. like someone in the punk scene who is professing certain values, but then, you know, maybe not their, their behaviors don't reflect that or they water them down. And of course, like that's a different headspace when someone that you're close with or like on the quote unquote same side with is maybe doing something that, um, again, is creates that sense of conflict. And so for me, like, Personally, I'm always struggling, you know, uh, with when do I engage? Um, when do I just listen? When do I ignore? So I'm just sort of curious, like with all that's been going on the last few years in your own life, um, has that been a struggle of, of recently? Or how do you tend to handle that when someone that's really close to you, you know, is maybe kind of shifting gears and making you uncomfortable with what they're doing? Yeah, that's so tough. Um, I feel like. I'm probably not a great person to ask that because I still struggle with that so much if okay. I'm being totally honest. Uh, but, you know, I'm just always trying to give myself as much time as I can to form the thought and the reaction because my default mode is lightning quick. It's the stress and anxiety from being a kid uh, in a setting where I was one of the only Asian kids, I had to be very quick with my comebacks and responses because my pride was dominant when I was a child, especially in social settings at school, and I didn't want to be belittled or embarrassed, right? So in my adult life, it caused many, many, many problems <laughs> because this is no way to this is no way to interact with people, you know? So, you know, with these difficult times, it's so rough, you know. Um, like I was saying, I'm just always trying to give myself as much time as possible. Um, if I can give myself even like more than a day, it only gets better for me. And it's the only thing I've identified that was really applicable in a practical way on a day-to-day -day basis, other than me just setting boundaries for myself and uh, starting with certain subjects, just don't go there, you know, with this sort of things. And then when that fails, then with the person, the interaction just gets severely limited until it's cut off, you know? So that's all yeah. I know. I'm such a, I'm such a weak, imperfect human in that way, especially with certain, uh, particular social and political opinions, you know? And it sucks because we know 
Everybody knows that it's not this formed thing. It's not these separated bodies. These things are kind of like, you know, they grow on people in different proportions, in different areas, and in different ways. So, you know, we can't, it, separating these things from relationships and people has become the most difficult that it's ever been, surely. Yeah. So I, I'm trying to get better at it because, you know, for people who share our general view, uh, socially, politically, um, unless we want to be relegated to like total alienation from a lot of things that still have value and a lot of relationships that still have value outside of that, um, we got to find a way because one of the hardest things for me to come to terms with still, and I've intellectually recognized this for many years now, is that there is still more to people than their political views. And I really wrestle with that because there's still this impulse in me to be like, but it ramifies so much. But it's like, no, for people that don't think deeply, that maybe are of a medium intelligence, that don't put their effort into understanding these systems and, and failures and stuff, there is more to them because they don't get it. It's like this ignorance, you know? So, man, I wrestle with that shit constantly. Yeah. I mean, but it's it's huge to be perceptive and responsive to even think about these, you know, to even just be critical of ourselves. And there's so many some people out there who don't even have that lens at all, you know. So, um, yeah, I hear, I hear you there. And yeah, not surprised that's the line you chose, but you know, you're, you're living it like less talk, more rock. Like there it is. Less talk. Like, hold on. Like, let me, let me digest this. Let me let this percolate for a little bit. So, yeah. Yeah. But I, I have multiple people inside of me. I have that person in me that wants to be reasonable. And I, I usually like to have that person in the driver's seat, but uh, there's been a few times where there's that person on in me that wants to put on a mask, and go out there and punch some Nazis, if I'm being honest, like, you know, but I realize that that will only lead to more unhappiness for myself. And so, you know, I just got to let that pass through me. Right. Well, again, that dichotomy is, I think it's an important one to consider. And it's something that I think most of the listeners of this podcast can relate to for sure. So, uh, you know, I guess as we start to wrap up, um, do you have any other final thoughts on either the impact that propaganda has had on you personally or just maybe where they fit in the history of, of music? Um, any other any last thoughts there? Man, you know. I know I've already said this in a couple different ways, but. the. I don't want to say educational because it's not educational. It's merely introducing this totally different perspective on our current forms of government and other systems of um, the economic structure, in particular, uh, the meat industry, you know, and issues around veganism. And I cannot state enough the uniqueness of the power of propaganda songs to inject these really complex ideas um, in a way that really, it really helped me understand. And to have that juxtaposition of John songs that are clearly speaking to a very uh, vulnerable emotional side in multiple ways, alongside these empowered, really forward piercing lyrics, creates this whole total thing that was another uh, example of making sure that whatever you did, especially with bands and in the genre of punk and indie, because there's so many bands, make your little universe vast 
and and diverse and unique because that's what will keep real fans and what really engages people be multidimensional and i try to live that way in my life in how i enjoy things and how i view things and how i learn and interact and it all resonates with that it's like to have a punk band like propagandi be able to do that and i'm realizing now this now as i'm saying it it's it's really amazing you know it's really amazing um but what was always dominant for me is injecting these social and political ideas that I benefit from and didn't just nudge me. I mean, they completely like put their hands on my head and, and turned it this way <laughs> and said, hey, look. And so I'm not saying that I listened to the song once and said, oh, this is what I believe. It was like, whoa, what? What is he saying? Wait, 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 what? Whoa. Huh? And then I read about it. I research it. You know, I get into these other books. I find my way to books like Confessions of an Economic Hitman. I read all these sorts of things. It's like they set me on that path to seeing, and in a way, I guess, cursed me too, so... No, thank you on that. <laughs> the curse of <laughs> seeing the truth of a lot of this stuff. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I am grateful. And uh, like I started, I, I, can't, I can't say enough how important that was for me. As, as, like for my experience of the world. These are ideas that literally change your view of the world. Hey, man. So, yeah. Well... Thanks so much for those reflections. Um, thank you for being here. I, you know, I was going to actually, I do have one final question. This is um, no problem. If, if you're up for an act of solidarity with me, okay? Tomorrow morning, will you commit to using props, P R O P S, as your first wordle? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And if we get it one out of six, then I'm going to fly out of California and we're going out to dinner or something if we get one out of six. But. Uh, Sounds good. Okay. How how strong is your feeling about props right now? Uh, it's up there. It's up there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm feeling confident. How many days have you used it already? Oh no, I haven't. It's a fresh one. I I go different every day, but I'm just saying tomorrow I'm feeling good about it. Got to honor them. Props for the wordle. Totally done. I'm with it. All right, love it. Well, Steve, uh, thanks again so much for uh, taking time. Uh, I'm going to give you a cheers. I see you got your tea there, so we'll do a little virtual cheers. And cheers, uh, bro. really appreciate you coming out and talking with us. Uh, thanks again for having me, and thanks for all of the thoughtful questions uh, and engagement. Made it way more interesting and fun for me, so I appreciate you. Sure. All right, adios. All right, take care. Some of my otherwise brilliant productive friends like scoundrels and their flags they find a refuge in Character assassination They ignore the issue, deny the relation between Consumption and brutality And you can roll your eyes And marginalize me And play on insecurities And you can fake ignorance you're not stupid, you're just selfish And you're a slave to impulse And I kind of thought we all shared common threads But now we gravitate here to challenge conventions we've been fed Cultures that treat creatures like machines And if you buy that shit, then how long till it's me Who serves as your commodity? Through institutional lies, violence and oppression of workers, women raped by sexes or men. Do you still insist on failing in dignity, to reason, collective self-interest? I'll call you on your shit, please call me on mine. Yeah, then. We can grow together, make this shit whole planet better in time. 
consider someone else 